Benham, it's great to see you. Uh, the screen is now yours to tell us everything about Iran and particularly what's happening with the nuclear issue and uh, the impact uh, a, a President Trump or a President Biden will make on these profoundly important issues. Welcome. Colin, Joel, thank you so much for that very kind, very warm and exceptionally generous introduction. Uh, we've traveled quite a bit through together to Australia. In fact, it was through you guys and through AJAC and the generosity of AJAC more generally that I got to first come to Australia, travel, speak with folks, journalists, government officials, uh, and really get to meet people who care about the same issues I do uh, more than halfway across the world. So really it's a great pleasure. Uh, as both Joel and Colin alluded to some of the historicity that uh, we're living through right now, I want to apologize for being a little bit late. I rushed back from a very socially distant work dinner. In fact, it was the first time I saw some folks since March. I know there's a lockdown in Australia. My thoughts and prayers are with you. I understand it's quite a tough time, uh, not just there, but all the way um, around the world with the coronavirus. So this has impacted many uh, of us personally and professionally. But one thing to keep our eye on is that international politics, international relations has not stopped. And in many ways it's sped up. Tomorrow, uh, at least tomorrow, East Coast time, uh, there is something very historic and on the White House lawn, much like you had a, an Arab-Israeli peace agreement between Sadat and Begin be signed in the presence of a U.S. president, you will again have another Arab-Israeli uh, peace agreement signed in the presence of another American president. And in many ways, it's the continuation and the change uh, of that legacy. And so that's something that's certainly impacting the Washington environment right now. Um, but Something else that I follow personally and professionally is the Iran issue. I'm an Iranian American, I'm born and raised in the States, but professionally I'm caring about the foreign and security policy of the Islamic Republic, the repression of the Islamic Republic at home and its aggression abroad, how they're linked, how they're tied. And to be frank, it is now bleeding into American domestic politics. Many of you around the world know that American domestic politics is really on full display for the world. In, in many ways, I think this is a structural cleavage in both our society and our culture. Uh, you know, society's culture, governments kind of being torn apart by this partisanship. And it's really happening in real time for the world to see. And of course, as it touches domestic issues, it touches foreign policy issues. And one of the ways that this structural divide has touched the Iran issue is through the fact that President Donald Trump basically did a 180 to what President Obama had done, which is President Obama had reversed course on not an American unilateral policy, but on a previous series of multilateral United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, which really escalated in scale, scope, and penalty from 2006 to 2010. Several of those resolutions against Iran at the UN Security Council were under Bush. The perhaps the most powerful one actually was under President Obama. Three years after that most powerful resolution in 2010, you had the 2013 Iran interim nuclear deal called JPOA. And then two-ish years after that, you had the JCPOA in 2015. And uh, President Donald Trump left the JCPOA on May 8, 2018. And in about two, two and a half years time from May 2018 to May 2020, he restored almost every single sanction, every single penalty that was waived by that historic accord in 2015. And that restoration process and building on those penalties is what Washington calls the maximum pressure policy. And as contentious as this is abroad, and I've traveled not just in Australia, but in Europe and Asia, talking, lecturing, speaking about this issue, as contentious as I know it is abroad, it's also contentious at home. And bringing this further home, Yesterday on Sunday, United States, uh, Vice Presidential Candidate Joe Biden, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, who is the presidential candidate on the Democratic side, actually penned an op-ed uh, for CNN about this issue, laying out his administration's prospective Iran policy, should he be elected into office in November and should he take that office in January. And in many ways, it has this structural thing that I think foreign watchers need to be aware of when it comes to American foreign policy. And that structural thing is there is a trend in the American presidency ever since the end of the Cold War to do the exact opposite of your predecessor and to reap or seek political domestic dividends for doing so. If you remember, 
uh, President George H.W. Bush, he had one term, one term of realism, you could say, where it was hard-nosed national security politics, the liberation of Kuwait, but not pressing into Iraq. He kept U.S.-China talks uh, really in some ways afloat despite the massacre that was Tiananmen and really the tragedy that was Tiananmen. Um, dealt with rising issues of nuclear proliferation and terrorism, but again, a hard-nosed, you know, realistic per the IR school of thought uh, applied to American foreign policy, which was reversed by two uh, successive uh, elections of Bill Clinton, who had a more liberal interventionist, liberal internationalist policy. And if you may not recall this because of 9-11, the US wars in Iraq, the US wars in Afghanistan, and the freedom agenda under George W. Bush, when President, when then candidate George Bush was campaigning, he campaigned uh, basically calling for, for a quote, humble foreign policy. Again, these were changed just a few months later with the election, with 9-11 with and all the wars that followed in the Middle East. But again, it was a real 180 to Clinton. And the escalation and intensification of the Iranian nuclear dispute happened on George W. Bush's watch. It's when Iran's nuclear file, uh, which is dealt with by the International Atomic Energy Agency, that's a UN organ, was transferred from this key UN organ to the UN Security Council because the international community believed that Iran's nuclear activities were not just civil in nature. It was not just a couple of accidents or mistakes where Iran wasn't properly reporting things to the 35 member board of governors of the IAEA. It, it was actually deemed a threat to international peace and security. And that's when you have these escalating sanctions resolutions. Obama reversed the Bush policy on Iran. And then of course, on May 8, 2018, you had the Trump reversal of the Obama policy on Iran. One thing per the CNN article of Joe Biden on Iran is that that temptation is again, apparently, apparently manifest to talk about diplomacy with Iran in this way. There's nothing wrong with diplomacy, but the lessons of history tell us that diplomacy is best used when married with force or married with some kind of coercive instrument. The government of Iran, both under the Shah, which was pro-Western, and under the Ayatollahs, which created the Islamic Republic and is anti-Western, uh, have pursued a nuclear program in one shape or another since the 1950s, with drastically different international consequences. But America has, under both the Shah and Ayatollah, been concerned about how Iran's ultimate interest in quote-unquote civil nuclear programs could very, very, very easily bleed into a nuclear weapons capacity and an eventual nuclear weapon. So, here again, uh, Joe Biden talked about diplomacy uh, with the Islamic Republic. And if Iran uh, returned to strict compliance with the JCPOA, uh, this agreement that President Trump left in 2018 and President Obama helped uh, attain in 2015, then of course the US would return to this agreement as well. For many of my friends and colleagues uh, in Europe and around the world, that is the end of the story. But if you're an Iran watcher like me, that's really the beginning. Uh, of the story. Why is that the beginning of the story? Because, well, Iran has its own politics too. Even authoritarian regimes like the Islamic Republic have competitive stage managed elections and selectively they can trot out quote unquote moderates that help to deflate or de-escalate foreign pressure to gain strategic time for the regime to actually be able to rebuild some of its capacity, whether that's nuclear capacity or insulate its economy and that was really what Hassan Rouhani, Iran's current president, who is in his lame duck phase and uh, will leave office next year in 2021, really helped accomplish for the uh, Islamic Republic until Donald Trump came into office and pulled, Amer and pulled America slowly, if I may add, out of this multilateral accord called the JCPOA. Biden's desire, perhaps by politics of the Democratic Party, perhaps for purposes of genuine sheer national security strategy being interested in this accord, or perhaps for issues of legacy. Again, he was the vice president to Obama when this uh, agreement was inked. And uh, as is apparent for his campaign, there's lots of prominent former Obama folks on his campaign staff. So it makes sense that he's interested in this deal. But my fear is that clawing back of this accord is not going to uh, help American national security. It's not going to help the global nonproliferation regime. It's not going to help people including America's multilateral partners in the United Nations Security Council who helped gain these multiple resolutions that were ultimately done away with, with this 2015 nuclear deal. Uh, it's going to help Ali Khamenei, Iran's current supreme leader, and it's going to help the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, which is the Praetorian Guard of the Islamic Republic and protects Ali Khamenei 
and is what really makes Iran a revolutionary state. It's going to help them. And that's my big fear is when domestic politics becomes so important that it can fog or cloud out the judgment uh, of any leader or, or any actor um, and thus actually hurt your foreign policy or hurt your security policy. So if the U.S. ends up having this election and, and the Americans are so interested in clawing back this JCPOA deal at any cost, then, of course, this could happen. But as I mentioned, Iran has politics. In February of this year, something worth keeping in mind, the Islamic Republic had parliamentary elections where there was a massive hardliner sweep. And we're living in a deja vu moment, and I, and I make this point in an upcoming article I have, so consider this a sneak peek for AJAC. Uh, essentially, the hardline sweep in the 2020 parliamentary elections in February is setting the stage for the new hardline president to come in in 2021. And there's a high likelihood that if there's a new hardline president, a new hardline parliament, uh, a new generation of national security elites that actually think America is a paper tiger, that actually think based on the recent wars of the way Iran has prosecuted several conflicts in the Middle East, be it in Syria, Yemen, Iraq, or Lebanon, it feels like he can actually win. It feels like it has a comparative advantage in war fighting against this tired aging superpower who is looking to pivot to Asia. Um, those guys, those leaders, bustled, of course, by a 81, 82, if I'm not mistaken, uh, year old supreme leader uh, who uh, is increasingly skeptical and distrustful of not just America, but America's European partners, they could say no. And as I flesh out in this uh, forthcoming article, there doesn't seem to be any strategy in place, at least per what Biden and his team have made clear as to what could be the prospective democratic platform uh, in 2021 and beyond, if there, if there is actually a Biden uh, administration. What happens if Iran says no? What happens if America, even if it is so desperate uh, to claw back this accord, even if it is willing to enter a phased approach as some prominent think tanks in Washington, which are uh, proponents of the 2015 accord have talked about, even if there is this approach, what then? What if Iran says no? What will US foreign policy towards Iran be then? Will Biden, which has campaigned against Trump, have to use Trump's prominent national security tools, basically the maximum pressure campaign, even though uh, as a candidate, and in fact, most of the Democratic Party have disavowed those tools and uh, been highly critical of the more confrontational and albeit risk tolerant path that President Trump has been willing to trod uh, to get a much broader, bigger, better, comprehensive agreement. There is a large question mark there that I think puzzles domestic and foreign watchers uh, when it comes to what happens when the best laid plans actually make contact with reality. So I wanted to plant this question in the minds of AJAC viewers, given Iran's turbulent domestic politics, uh, because if there is a, a change in 2020, and because I've talked about these highly public cleavages in American politics and American society, um, to ask what happens if there is this, again, change, what happens when the Ayatollahs say no? And they could say no simply as a stalling tactic, of course. The way I see max pressure going is that it's a matter of when, not if, Iran will negotiate with America. Remember, from 2002 all the way up until 2015, there was a large portion of time there when Iran even refused to concede on enrichment. That's the process by which you actually take uranium uh, this fissile material and actually uh, take it from its after its raw state after it's been mined and milled and everything it's basically what you need to purify to enrich this material to get it ready for a nuclear weapon and there's different stages of uranium enrichment the jcpoa that 2015 deal was historic because it actually permitted in some weird way enrichment uh, even though of course there were multiple u.n security councils on iran attempting to prohibit or ban enrichment because Iran was in violation of multiple other safeguards and agreements with the IAEA. So there is this larger dressing that you need to be aware of, this larger window dressing, which is if there's a change and the Ayatollah will say no, what then? What then for US foreign policy? Let me plant that seed. But let's pivot to the incumbent. You know, people have always talked about uh, kind of 
natural benefit that the incumbent has. After all, they, they have the perks of the office. Trump is able to fly around on Air Force One. That's the, the American jet that carries the president. There is, of course, the, the pomp and circumstance of the office. There's the ability to actually continue conducting foreign policy uh, as you know, a president in real time, ha having uh, the American public be able to judge you. Uh, what happens if Trump is reelected in November of this year? What will Iran policy be in 2021? Well, one school of thought is that it's more of the same, but a reading of the tea leaves here should tell us that even President Trump uh, has indicated that there are some signals where he would take an off ramp to this escalation. Remember, he backed down uh, from the uh, potential use of uh, military action against Iran after Iran downed an American drone uh, last summer in international waters. So there's that. He inched away uh, from the decision to use force there. There is, of course, also the broad threshold that America has had for the use of force in the Middle East, which is it now seems like America will only use kinetic action if, of course, its own service persons or if American blood is spilt. The escalation cycle that you're seeing in places like Iraq today, where there were actually intercepted rocket attacks by pro-Iran groups against American targets, that is no longer a threshold for America to be responding to military force. What Trump has signaled to Iran is that he will only respond if there is a loss of American life. So that's a rather high threshold. And that shows that there is a high tolerance uh, for risk there. And in fact, a desire not to go to war or a desire not to rush to a kinetic solution. So put that, put that on your plate as well. And then add in a few other things that we glean from tweets, which is the president has talked about how great it would be to perhaps meet the Iranian president. At that point, it was uh, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, and that he is actually, of course, desiring a deal. And if you go all the way back to his candidacy from 2015 to 2016, when then candidate Trump talked about the Iran deal, he was one of the few, if not the only Republican candidates who said he wouldn't leave the Iran deal on day one. And in fact, in office, he did not leave the Iran deal on day one. It took about a year and a half uh, first for him to leave. But he talked about buying bad deals and making good deals. So there's this deal-making desire there. There's this incarnation. And of course, I believe last August when Trump met with uh, French President Emmanuel Macron, uh, it was Trump who mentioned publicly the prospect of a, of a potential line of credit uh, rather than direct cash, or, or but a line of credit to Iran uh, that could function as sanctions relief to help generate some kind of diplomatic uh, this, uh, diplomatic uh, booster for talks between either Iran and the U.S. or a P5 plus one platform with Iran to uh, engage again with the international community. So there, there are all these indications that Trump too is looking for off ramps. That uh, despite what you may hear in the media, that the president in fact is interested in getting a deal. And while this could lead you to believe that okay, you know he'll only take an off ramp if the Iranians will give it to him, and otherwise maximum pressure will continue full speed ahead. And in fact, that would be my recommendation, is that there is no way out but through. You have to actually continue this pressure policy and only reverse course when the Iranians say uncle. Otherwise, you're going to be recreating the political conditions that existed from 2013 to 2015, which is that you signal to the Islamic Republic that you are more desperate for an accord with them for political reasons than they are to have an accord with you for economic reasons, for purposes of sanctions relief. So that too could happen. And then of course, let's not forget another trend in the American presidency, also in the post Cold War era, which is that in the second term or presidents who have a second term, and with the exception of George H.W. Bush, that's been every post Cold War president, uh, presidents seek a legacy. And in fact, they look to enshrine that legacy in foreign policy. Bill Clinton tried Arab-Israeli peacemaking. George W. Bush had uh, the handover of the Iraq war as well as uh, the PEPFAR program in Africa. Then of course, Obama had the JCPOA. What will Trump's foreign policy legacy be if he has a second term? It's worth asking what kind of deal the deal maker in chief allegedly would look to want to tout. And of course, having made several versions of quote unquote, the ultimate deal with the UAE and now the Bahraini peace deals, there is of course this lingering Iranian potential for a deal. So could the president's desire for a potential foreign policy legacy outweigh the national security impetus of dealing with the Iran file in a more judicious way and in a way that requires a continuation, if not escalation 
of American economic pressure on Iran. So the point of this discussion to kind of put a nicer cherry on this large Sunday is to talk about these two structural factors for international audiences to know these trends. One is to do the opposite of your predecessor, and two is if you have a second term to look for a legacy and enshrining foreign policy. Then of course, talk about each candidates. And while you think that a Biden administration may look to easily return to the JCPOA, Iranian regional escalation, Iranian nuclear escalation, and in fact, most importantly, Iranian domestic politics is likely to complicate that. And then of course, while you may think a Trump administration is simply easily going to continue max pressure because it's the one who conceived of max pressure, um, there are of course indications that the commander in chief is looking for off ramps. And when you look at the way the US is selectively disengaging and withdrawing troops from the region, withdrawing missile defenses from the region, there is more meat that you could put on that bone about this, about this thesis as well. So you have the positions of these two American candidates. You have, of course, Iranian behavior during this whole time, which was the prominent feature of my trip to uh, Australia, uh, which was actually one year ago this month, um, where we talked about Iranian graduated escalation, where the regime is looking to still signal resolve against America, to still threaten America, but they still try to keep Europe as a key adherent in this deal. That was true one year ago. It remains true today. Iran is hoping that a troika of forces continues to keep the Europeans in this accord. And that troika is first and foremost economic, that the Europeans have a mercantilist interest in continuing this JCPOA, because if there is more compliance by Iran or if America is ever brought on board again, then of course the trade can resume. And of course, Europe has had a drastically different Iran policy than America for the past 40 years. The time that it's been most together was the escalation period of the JCPOA, and then of course the JCPOA itself. So there's a desperation for Europe to get back to that. Next is an ideological one. It's the philosophy of resolving conflicts through peaceful means of conflict adjudication. That the Europeans sometimes are sick and tired of hearing that the Islamic Republic is an ideological actor, a revisionist actor, an anti-status quo actor in the region, that it's the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. Never mind the fact that Iran has agents abroad. You know, the, the same day that Joe Biden wrote an article in CNN about a, um, a, a potentially new Iran policy, you had a few hours later in this uh, American outlet called Politico, a story of an Iranian assassination plot that was uncovered by American intelligence to kill slash to kill uh, the American ambassador to South Africa, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so within hours, it tells you how consistent this lingering terror threat is by the Islamic Republic. So two is this philosophy by the Europeans to kind of ignore these ideological and strategical uh, imperatives the Islamic Republic has to continue to keep to continue to continue to keep acting the way it is, and ultimately just to say that we can resolve everything through diplomacy. And that third leg of this troika is, of course, that on its nuclear merits, the Europeans now, having gone through the JCPOA, lived through past UN Security Council resolutions, they feel comfortable with what the JCPOA achieved and want to return to it as a predicate to build on on it for, for other non-proliferation gains. I have qualms with, three of, with all three of these legs of this troika, but nonetheless, these three forces together animate Europe. And this very fluid combination of Iranian nuclear escalation, very public American domestic politics, um, and then of course, this European insistence to keep the deal is going to be a key engine uh, of, the, of this conflict, this nuclear drama, moving forward. And it'll be a drama that operates in the background of the UNGA just a few days from now. And it's going to be a drama that's going to operate in the background of the US presidential election. And it's going to be a drama that will land squarely on the president's desk uh, when the new president or the same president is again inaugurated or re-inaugurated in January of 2021. I thank you so much for your time and attention. And I'm ready to take your questions through the format Colin and Joel deem fit. Thank you, Benham, for that uh, very comprehensive analysis. I appreciate it greatly. And uh, it's good to see you on camera finally. I didn't get to say that in my <laughs> intro. Um, I might start off uh, the questions, Benham. I might uh, package two together. I'm going to go to normalization to kick us off. So as we know, Bahrain and the UAE have recently announced that they will normalize relations with Israel. 
How do you think the Israeli-Arab reapproachment will impact the strategic situation in terms of Iran and as well as Turkey in the region? And then the second question slightly attaches to that, more narrow specifically to Bahrain. As we know, the Bahraini demographics of a, uh, the royal family ruling over a population that is mostly Shia and has experienced uprisings and instability in the past, as well as an active Hezbollah cell, do you think the IRGC could destabilize the country given the normalization announcement? I think those are excellent questions and, and unlike uh, much of my presentation, they, they actually have a bit of a simpler answer. Uh, the first part of your question about the, the wave of normalization, really given the, the drama of Arab-Israeli peace, is that Iran is the big loser, ideologically and strategically, with this new wave of normalization. You have the southern part of the Islamic world, the Arabian Peninsula, playing a key role in major historical developments now. And it is pro-American countries, pro-status quo countries, and it's countries that have largely, assumedly, likely had uh, underground or covert relations with the Israelis probably for a decade now, driven by security concerns. So it's been the Islamic Republic's uh, foreign and security policy that in many ways has helped bridge this ideological, ethnic, uh, long-standing conflict in the Middle East. So in some weird way, uh, the Islamic Republic is the outsized factor driving promoting Arab-Israeli peace. And so long as Iran retains this revisionist foreign security policy, those dynamics, those incentives for these countries are still there. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, there is likely a desire to kind of stem this debate over quote-unquote annexation. Some of the Gulf states saw themselves as protectors of the Palestinian cause this way. There is, of course, immense benefit for any country in the region to want to engage economically, techni technologically with Israel, which is really a Silicon Valley sitting there in the Middle East. Why not? There's these immense dividends. But the 800-pound gorilla in the room remains Iran. And Iran, la at the last UNGA, Iran's President Hassan Rouhani delivered a speech in Persian, but he said one line in Arabic. And he said what that one line was an old... Uh, Arabic proverb, and it was first the neighbor, then the house. Iran was trying to intimidate it, the, the Arab states of the Persian Gulf by basically saying, you guys have been worried about your own security so much that you've isolated your neighbor and you've brought in all these foreign forces. But really what history has shown with this wave of normalization is that Iran has been the one irritating, uh, irritating and agitating its neighbors. So I think that, that helps contextualize the wave of normalization uh, a bit for our audience. The, the Bahrain one is one that I've been long concerned about. Yes, the demographics matter, but demographics, demography is not destiny. Uh, for the success of, of really the democracy or, or representative government in the Arab and Muslim world, it's not gonna be about ethnicity or sex in my view. It really should be about civics, you know, equal opportunity before the law, equal access. And so long as Bahrainis have that, and they really feel that they are part of some national compact, Iran will have a very hard time drawing and clawing on the downtrodden and dispossessed of that society, of which there are always downtrodden and dispossessed in any society. This is not utopia. This is the real world. But there was a very real concern here for Iran to be able to destabilize Bahrain, Bahrain with less money and less weapons uh, than it has been able to destabilize other neighboring Arab countries which have taken more time, more weapons, and a whole different series of networks. Iran, as you know, I, I talked about with this South African uh, alleged assassination attempt, uses uh, a, a plethora of different carve-outs to, to mask its terrorism apparatus. Politico reported that the Iranian embassy in South Africa was a key hub. Uh, in 2019, the Iranian consulate in Istanbul was a key hub for an assassination attempt. I would look to Iranian diplomatic facilities in, in the Gulf region to play this dual role and express some significant concern there. Thank you, Ben. And ladies and gentlemen, just a reminder to utilize the raised hand feature inside Zoom today. You'll see at the bottom, there will be at the bottom of the screen, there'll be a participant tab. You can click that and at the bottom of the list of participants, you'll see the raised hand feature. You can also utilize the chat feature to send through a question and we will get to that if time permits. I'd now like to hand over to Ajax Aaron Shapiro. Need to unmute yourself there, Aaron. Oh. 
Hold on, I'll give you one more try. If not, I'll go to Svee Fleisch while we'll wait for Aaron to fix up those technical issues. To Svee. Um, go Svee, we can hear you. Great. Uh, hi, uh, hi, Benham. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I'd like to ask about the, the situation of Kylie Moore Gilbert, which is the Australian uh, academic who's been in a, an Iranian prison after two years on what appear to be trumped up espionage charges. There's a bit of a debate in Australia about whether quiet diplomacy or public efforts to call attention to her plate are more effective in getting her released. Uh, what's your advice to Australia, to Canberra, uh, in, in pursuing this, this very tragic case uh, based on your uh, knowledge of past experience with people, uh, foreigners arrested by, uh, by the Iranian regime? I think this is an excellent question because it, it tugs both at the head and the heart, right? There's strategy, but there's also the human dimension, the moral dimension. And uh, usually Iran is at the intersection of both in the Middle East. It's usually kind of hard to have both a pragmatic and value-based foreign and security policy for, for any nation in, in the region, given how troublesome it is. But with the case of hostages in the Islamic Republic, dual nationals, as you know, Kylie Moore is a British, uh, British Australian, Nazanin Zargari Ratcliffe, another hostage is an Iranian Brit. Uh, you know, Iran loves to target dual nationals. Iran loves to exploit people with any kind of perceived ties. Remember, of course, they took Xu Wang, uh, who was a Chinese American because he was studying, uh, not medieval, but um, late, uh, late modern 1890s uh, Iranian history, if I'm not mistaken, uh, using Iranian archives. So there's always this kind of trumped up charge. And I think the key thing for the foreign ministry of any country that has a detained person in, uh, in the Islamic Republic is to put the spotlight on it, to cite how ridiculous the, the jailing, the, the prosecuting, uh, the detention, and the hostage taking actually is, how unfortunate it is, and how deplorable it is that this is a long standing trend in the Islamic Republic, that it's part and parcel of their foreign and security policy, that while they often seek something, in many ways also, it's Iran trying to use Westerners, use non-Iranians as playthings, both as part of their unfortunate domestic politics and both as pawns in some kind of larger strategic game against the West. So I think in this case, while I understand anyone who would want to come to me and say, oh, no, please, we don't want to aggravate the situation. Uh, in this case, I think a, a full spotlight approach uh, is, is going to be helpful. And if, and if not helpful in attaining her release in the short term, it will be in the medium to long term. But in the short term, the, these things get reported in the prisons of Iran. You know, people know when their name is in the press. You know, one need only look to the case of Jason Rezaian. If I'm not mistaken, um, he also too is in favor of um, kind of putting the spotlight on, on the Islamic Republic for their behavior here. I think I was quoted alongside him in an Australian radio broadcast, uh, essentially saying the same thing. And while I respect his, his journalistic work very much, you know, him and I have different foreign policy prescriptions, but here's a case where you have people with different foreign policy views being able to converge on the imperative of putting the spotlight on the Islamic Republic's bad behavior and continuing to press them uh, for the release. Thank you, Benham. Next question will go to Judy Maynard. Hello. Um, Iran sparked international outrage over the weekend with the execution of the wrestler Navid Afkari, based it seems on a coerced confession. Could you give us some background please on the use of forced confessions by the Iranian judiciary? And also what should international sporting bodies like the IOC and FIFA, which expressed deep concern about Afkari's plight, what should they do now? I think the practical component of your question is really the part I want to draw um, some, some attention to here, because this is not going to be about changing uh, a Twitter profile or a street sign to, to commemorate uh, or to mourn the loss uh, of this individual. Uh, but it's really going to be about using the right tools of public diplomacy to pressure the Islamic Republic. And here, I think you hit the nail on the head, the Olympics any kind of major sporting organization Iran is a part of, multiple different wrestling organizations that have multinational unions across different parts of the world, they need to step up and they need to step up now. People who have wrestled with Afkari before, 
Another interesting group that it would be great to step up would be to have former American Olymp Olympiads who have wrestled with Iranian wrestlers. As you know, in the late 1990s, there was a thing called wrestling diplomacy between the Clinton administration and, and uh, the Khatami administration in Iran. So I think there is really a way to kind of name and shame the Iranian judiciary using or through the prism of this sports world, right? There is an entire avenue anyone can pursue. In fact, uh, the organization I work for, uh, FGD, has put out a long report, I think several months back, about Iran's systemic use of tortured confessions, really how Iranian state TV, worst of all, uh, has broadcast these tortured confessions over satellite and uh, continues in many ways to broadcast these egregious things, to continues to broadcast the results of these tortured confessions, continues to try to turn Iranian families, Iranian friends against themselves. The, the terrifying thing about Afkari's case uh, is that also he has brothers who've been jailed for different uh, time, time periods as well. I think one for 20 some odd years, and another one for 50 some odd years. So really there, there's unfortunately a long trend of the Iranian judiciary doing this. It's because of the involvement of Iran's security services. Uh, it's because Iran's judicial apparatus post-1979 falls far short of international law. But worse, Iranian prosecution of alleged criminals, and in this case, uh, Iranian lawyers have contested every single aspect of the state's case against Afkari. Um, still, you know, Iranian courts fall short of their own exceptionally low bar. So now is the time for the European countries that maintain diplomatic relations with the Islamic Republic to point this out, to cut this off. This is supposed to be the beacon uh, of liberal democracies around the world. You know, they have qualms or they have issues with the way American handles Iran policy, fine. Represent, uh, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Represent your own actions through your own foreign policy. Reprimand Tehran like they used to in the 1990s, by the way. There was a period where Iranians used to go abroad and assass assassinate dissidents on European soil, and Europe withdrew ambassadors uh, from Iran. It took a while uh, to reestablish relations for select European countries uh, with Tehran after the wave of assassinations on the European continent in the 1990s. I understand this is different because this is on Iranian soil, but the key thing is to realize domestic repression and foreign aggression are linked in the Islamic Republic. So I think the least the world could do is to have these different wrestling unions and wrestling federations which are multinational express uh, strong grievances against the Islamic Republic, strongly condemn this action, kick Iran out, kick the Islamic Republic out of these various unions, kick them out of the Olympics, kick them out of FIFA, and really name and shame. Uh, the Islamic Republic is not North Korea. It is very well plugged into multiple international organizations, multiple international institutions. And sometimes it's easy to forget that lingering among these federations is the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism. And the longest suffering victims of that terrorism is, as in the case of Nabil Afkari, clearly Iranian citizens. Thank you, Ben. I'll now hand over to Anthony Cohen. Uh Thank you, uh, Am I on muted? Yeah, no, you're on, Anthony. Go for right, it. Thank you. Um, Two-part question. Um, Israel has stated that it will never allow Iran to get a nuclear weapon. In your opinion, how realistic is it to think that inevitably that will link to conflict? And the second part of the question is, how does the instability in Iraq feed into Iranian politics? Uh, excellent questions. But the, on the second one, do you mean how does instability in Iraq play into Iranian domestic politics or yes. into Iranian security policy? Both. So, okay. So to address the, the first question first about Israel, there's an assumption I think we need to remove from there or, or to kind of bring forward uh, which is that if a state pursues some sort of a nuclear program, uh, it is doing so for purposes that don't involve conflict. You know, again, as I mentioned, Iran has had a nuclear program in one shape or another since the late 1950s, both the Shah and the Ayatollahs. And the same two forces animate the Shah, animated the Shah and animate the Ayatollahs, but they animate these different leaders to different amounts. And these forces motivate every single country that has a nuclear weapons program in the world that currently has them and that used to have them. And that's status and security. 
And the Islamic Republic thinks it can achieve both uh, status because it's going to be this country that is, you know, pushing back on the liberal Western led world order to say, look what they've been able to accomplish in the scientific and technological realm, despite years of Western sanctions. Never mind, of course, that this is an Iranian talking point and that having a centrifuge is really outdated technology in the 2020s era. But nonetheless, this is what, what the Islamic Republic believes and promotes. So Israel on the conventional side, on the non-nuclear side, has been in many ways the most effective country, which has helped erode Iran's conventional military advantages. All you need to do is look at the Syrian battlefield, where despite the constant creeping up of pro-Iran proxies and all these other forces in the Syrian battle space, uh, there have been countless Israeli sorties into that country, really eroding this terror network that Qasem Soleimani, who was killed earlier this year by a U.S. drone strike, helped build up because these were the forces that he surged into that country for more than half a decade uh, to basically save the Assad regime. Uh, and a little while ago, I think maybe it's been about a year now, there was an Israeli journalist who showed me a cartoon in an Israeli paper about uh, Hassan Rouhani, Iran's president, next to an IRGC individual, and there's a guy loading some ammunition onto a, a large cargo aircraft. And uh, Rouhani turns to the IRGC individual and says, isn't it cheaper if we just blow it up here? Meaning that Iran is buying and, and sending these weapons for the Syrian battle space only to be blown up by the Israelis, which are willing to use kinetic force to roll back Iran's gains. So I think the Israelis have really shown the world something of a very unique model of not having a formal outright war against Iran, but really being able to erode some of Iran's battlefield gains. And if you layer the nuclear component onto that, which is some of the sabotage that we saw this summer at some of Iran's key nuclear facilities, particularly a centrifuge production plant, uh, which produced not just regular centrifuges, but advanced centrifuges for a city in the Tons where Iran has two plants, not one, the fuel enrichment plant and the pilot fuel enrichment plant. Iranians just a few days ago said that they had inaugurated that facility again, meaning that they had uh, struck ground to make an even bigger batter facility where they could produce more centrifuges. But guess what? That's going to take time. And it's highly likely that the explosions at the production site in the summer were acts of foreign sabotage and perhaps Israel. So Israel has helped introduce this equation uh, into uh, the world of policy making when it comes to how can one push back on the Islamic Republic. So it is not devoid of conflict. That entire question, Iran's quest for a nuclear weapon, as well as the options Israel has before it, inherently are all related to conflict. So just to kind of reframe your question <laughs> with, uh, in, in this way, I, I think there's no way that it can be devoid of conflict. Uh, he, he, Iran is diametrically opposed to everything Israel stands for, including its own existence. So there's no way you can have any part of this equation exist without conflict. And to the Iraqi one, the, the long and short answer is yes. You know, we're coming up on a very important anniversary, which is neglected in the West, and that's the Iran-Iraq War. If you think the Islamic Revolution of 1979 was cataclysmic, if you think the hostage taking of American diplomats for 444 days was cataclysmic, I got news for you. In Iran, the eight year conflict with Saddam Hussein's Iraq is likened to a World War III of sorts. It's really the conflict that set Iran on the revolutionary path it is today. And every single foreign policy problem we have with the Islamic Republic, terrorism, uh, escalation in the Persian Gulf, mines, ballistic missiles, nuclear capability, uh, global terror apparatus, again I mentioned, uh, all began and were cultivated during that war. And that war really taught Iran some perverse lessons about how anarchic the world is and really uh, the high price one will have to exact against the Islamic Republic. So that conflict taught Iran that, and it also taught Iran to forever intervene in Iraqi politics, forever intervene in Iraqi society. And that's why, unfortunately, as the U.S. looks to divorce itself from the Middle East, if it doesn't have an answer for Iraq, Iraq is about to become Iran's. Thank you for that, Benham. I'll now hand over to Oved Lebel. Still on mute there, Oved. How about now? Yeah, it's working now. Hey, Benham, good to see you again. Uh, I just want to ask about the chances of renewed protests. It's been about a year since Iran cracked down on the brutal protests. No, brutally cracked down on the protests last year. 
And uh, I was wondering whether you foresee them happening again this year and what kind of threat they pose to the regime. Oh, Ed, really good to see you. I uh, hope you're staying well and safe. Um, the question of more protests in Iran, really the rising up of the street against the state or the society against the state is again a matter of uh, when, not if. COVID-19 definitely had a major part to play here. There were several small peaks of protest in 2020. Some have continued on the labor front, uh, even into the summer actually, with a couple in different cities in Iran's southwest. But nonetheless, the types of protests we've seen inside the Islamic Republic from 2017 to present are fundamentally different from the ones that we saw that were more reform oriented in 1999 as well as in 2009. And yes, while there were elements that were totally anti-regime 100% in those elements, they were still tied to the reform movement, to the hopes and dreams of Khatami, to the hopes and dreams of Musavi, the hopes and dreams of reformers and other kind of liberal intellectuals who were crushed in 1999 and again had their hopes crushed in 2009. 2017 to present, these are really more blue collar folks. These are the urban and rural poor. In many ways, these were the next generation of who, the people who the revolution was really made for. And the fact that the Islamic Republic has not been able to materially, spiritually, uh, economically, politically, socially deliver for these folks means that it's really signed its own death warrant. That doesn't mean the regime's going to collapse tomorrow. That doesn't mean authoritarianism is gone from Iran. Not at all. But it does mean that there will continue to be more contests. So when corona lapses or when the Iranian people feel more comfortable or when there is something new introduced into this already highly combustible scenario, there will be, again, more protests. It's a mistake, I think, for some of my friends who are in the journalistic community, uh, both in the States and abroad, who have looked to these protests and just kind of looked at them as a, as a flashpoint, just looked at them as a snapshot, uh, rather than see them as part of a larger trend or a larger story or a larger narrative, because they all look at the December 2017 protests and they'll say, well, that's over chicken prices, chicken egg, uh, chicken egg prices and tomato prices. And uh, then they'll look at the 2019 ones and say, oh, that's over gas subsidies only. Yes and no. Those are only triggers to get the people out into the street. But once people are out to the street, they are fundamentally asking for a referendum on the foreign and security policy of the Islamic Republic. I don't know uh, what f uh, f uh, forget Assad think about us as a protest slogan by young Iranians and Iranians of really all stripes has to do with gasoline subsidies, what burning an effigy of the ring of Ayatollah Khomeini, the founding father of the Islamic Republic, has to do with gasoline prices. It doesn't. People are looking to grab onto the third rails, the taboos of Iranian society to signal that enough is enough. But again, what will the trigger be for these larger political protests? Something social, something economic? That part is unknown. But what it is known is that there will be more. Thank you, Benham. I'll now hand over to Ron Perez. Um, hi, Benham, and thank you for, uh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you for a very fascinating uh, talk so far. Two quick questions. The first one is, the, how do we respond to people saying uh, Trump's move to leave the JCPOA was a mistake, looking at the uh, breakout time? That's one thing. The other thing is, uh, again, the JCPOA is a framework because Biden is talking about sort of renewing or going back to uh, the JCPOA as a, as a starting point. Is it possible, uh, given that the uh, Iranians have sort of uh, used the tactic of slowly uh, encroaching, breaching, but gradually stepping away from the JCPOA, is it possible to use it as a starting point at all? I want to start with your last point, um, because I have strong convictions that you can't build on a faulty foundation. You have to have a good foundation if you want to erect some kind of edifice, some kind of building, if you want to establish some kind of trust. You can't build that on a faulty foundation. And the JCPOA, if it's going to be the predicate or the starting point or the launching point for potential diplomatic talks, I think you've already sowed the seeds of failure. I think you've already oriented the discussion to be slanted in a way that Iran can kind of bend the debate over breakout, over centrifuges, in a way that will benefit it, not perhaps at the time of signing, but in the short to medium term, and definitely in the long term. So contrary to the view taken by some folks who are still JCPOA defenders in the United States and abroad, I think if you 
simply just take the JCPOA uh, and try to revert to that. And then once you revert it to that and you've established this baseline, quote unquote, compliance with the JCPOA to try to build on that, I think that's a fool's errand. Uh, lest we forget some of these things, Colin mentioned the arms embargo, that lapses three weeks before the US uh, presidential election. How do you begin to walk that back when you're looking to build on the JCPOA? It's exceptionally unclear. And if it's still done so, I would say that would be exceptionally unwise. Um, I want to pivot to your first question now, because with respect, I forgot it. I was wondering if you could repeat it. We'll just unmute Ron there. Yes. Um, so just uh, how do you respond to the uh, claim that uh, stepping away no. from the JCPOA was a mistake? Okay. So I'm going to be blunt with you here, and I'm going to, in many ways, with respect, out myself. I don't think the way the president left the deal on May 8, 2018, was the wisest way to leave the deal. And to be frank, I was what you would call in the U.S. political debate a fixer, not a nixer. Uh, this was actually, I think, a paradigm coined by Bibi Netanyahu about maybe 10 months or so before the U.S. left the deal. But he was saying, fix it or nix it. And that means either fix the JCPOA or, or nix the JCPOA, you know, leave the JCPOA. And I think that at that point in time, given the way diplomacy was going with the Europeans, it was possible not to use the JCPOA as a predicate for talks, because as I just said, it's a faulty foundation, but you could use that period of time where the Europeans were willing to actually begin to say, maybe, yeah, maybe the JCPOA isn't the best thing since sliced bread to get them to flesh that point out a bit more. You know, from January 2018 to May 2018, Brian Hook and other members of the administration actually had a lot of meetings with the Europeans where they talked about missiles and sunset clauses and, and uh, enrichment caps and, and lots of other issues. And they even talked, uh, if you believe some of the mainstream reporting, about regional issues and terrorism, basically the stuff that has made and sustained Iran as a state sponsor of terrorism for four decades. And Yes, while ultimately nothing came of it and the US left the deal and the Europeans were mulling sanctions on this front but never got around to actually implementing them, they still, um, they, they still made some progress. And I think that there was a way to actually build on that progress to use these multiple sanctions waiver deadlines that hung over the head of the Trump administration as a way to force more European concessions, uh, to publicize what the administration publicized when it left the deal you know, the 12 points by Secretary Pompeo early on and say that this is the framework that we want and to cite where it was actually part of previous UN Security Council resolutions. I think there was a whole way to do that without leaving the JCPOA the way it did. But as they say, you don't cry over spilled milk and the administration left the deal. Since it left the deal, it has been remarkably successful in implementing and restoring unilateral sanctions pressure, much more so than the past, I would say, decade of multilateral sanctions pressure. To get to your point about the diminishing breakout timeline, yes, that is true, because Iran's approach here is not to rush to the bomb, it's to create this steady drip, this steady sensation of fear that Iran controls this escalation ladder, even though it's the weaker party. And this is designed to get the West, but particularly America, to rush to return either to the JCPOA, to return to the faulty foundation, or to force some kind of premature concession where there is a freeze for a freeze, where really dynamics that began and emerged in 2012, 2013 are manifest again in 2018 or 2020, which is we pay Iran to take a time off from its escalation ladder. And if you think that's a good policy, then go for it. But this is not about kicking the can down the road. That, that this is addressing Iran's nuclear threat and regional threat just can't be about kicking the can down the road. So Iran's shrinking of the breakout timeline is one measure of many measures it's doing to threaten the West, to threaten America, to say that it controls the way escalation is going to happen, and it's trying to signal something politically too. It's trying to say that breakout in the JCPOA was one year. I, Iran, because you, Trump administration slash America, have implemented max pressure, have left the deal, and I, I have shrunk in response to that breakout to 3.5 months. Well, there's a different measure we can use to respond to this, which is Iran now has just over two bombs worth of low enriched uranium stockpiles. When uh, the JPOA, the 2013 deal was being agreed to, Iran had over seven bombs worth. Now, while 
you know, deal defenders would say, look, you know, we got this percentage way down. And then because of max pressure, now Iran is accumulating more LEU. So now Iran is actually able to have enough LEU for weight one bomb, no two bombs worth of low enriched uranium. The response to that is, well, how come you were willing to tolerate up to seven bombs worth of low enriched uranium when you started negotiations with Iran? But now when we're trying to seek a bigger, broader, better deal, you are not willing to tolerate one to two bombs worth. There's, there's a there there that is not fair in this criticism. Yes, Iran is shrinking the, its breakout timeline. Yes, Iran's stockpile of LAU is growing. Yes, Iran is doing this to explicitly threaten and frighten Western governments. But what is the point? What is the point of a more risk tolerant strategy? It's that we desire a genuine, comprehensive, and actual solution to this problem, not a band-aid, right? We tolerated up to seven bombs worth of LEU, and we got a Band-Aid. So let's not be deterred, not be intimidated by the Islamic Republic. This is not meant to downplay the 3.5 month breakout and the two bombs worth of LEU, but it's to know what risks as national security professionals and analysts who deal with open source information, we are willing to run or willing to recommend or willing to deal with in the quest of a bigger, broader, better deal or an actual solution to this crisis. Thank you, Benham. I'll now hand over to Jeremy Jones to give our final question. Thank you. Go for it, Jeremy, you're all good. Yeah, I, thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I mean, there's a lot we could ask and uh, quite a bit laying over, but uh, the economic and social collapse of Lebanon, especially in light of the recent explosion that destroyed so much of Beirut, the question is, how does that look from Tehran? Is there a fear from them that Hezbollah's influence will wane because of this? Uh, or do they see chaos as an opportunity to further entrench? I must ask, related to that, Hezbollah as a problem, what should Australia and others be doing to stop Hezbollah wreaking the havoc it is doing, not only in Lebanon, but globally? Thank you. Jeremy, good to see you again. Um, thank you for a very, uh, I think, timely question given the explosions of that country, the economic collapse of that country, European renewed interest in Lebanon, particularly from France. This is a hot topic in Washington too, by the way. And th there's no real easy answer here because obviously the Islamic Republic has been long looking to Lebanon to be used as a jurisdiction of weak central authority as a carve out where when Iran is not permitted to touch the international financial system, Lebanon is, and through central, some Lebanese banks, businesses, Hawala networks, the Lebanese diaspora, mosques that Iran uses and uh, preachers Iran has all over the world and places where Hezbollah operatives operate near Iranian religious institutions in a faraway place in Latin America, Iran doesn't want that system to collapse. So it needs a semblance of order in Lebanon to be able to puncture the international community's use of rules, regulations, sanctions, and penalties to be able to get revenue, to be able to continue its ideological and strategic missions abroad. So it needs a semblance of some kind of functioning Lebanese state. But what Lebanon is signaling to the international community, and particularly to the international financial community with its significant debt and, and basically uh, meltdown, uh, financial meltdown in that country, is that it really can't actually have this orderly functioning uh, state in the country. Le Hezbollah has punctured that government multiple fold from the parliament to the cabinet. Uh, there's, there's different views obviously of Lebanon within, of Hezbollah within Lebanese society, but ultimately the more Hezbollah has become an arm of Iranian foreign and security policy, the less Lebanese Hezbollah has looked Lebanese, if you get my drift here. Uh, the more it, it has been exposed to being this pawn and proxy of Iran. And in the short term, that's a good thing. But once the reputation falls uh, and everyone says, oh, well, so what? Then we have an issue of state collapse, weak central authority. And compared to Washington, the Islamic Republic has a much better track record of being able to still achieve national security gains in a jurisdiction of weak central authority or in a jurisdiction where there is state collapse, like Iraq, for instance, where Iran has made immense gains when there was a collapse of central authority. My fear is that we may not have the correct political attention or time span to devote to Lebanon. We may think, oh, well, it's the Israel's northern border, let them handle it. We may think the US is pivoting from the region. Australia may think it's more about the China threat, more about cyber. What can we do? It may be a situation where everyone kind of puts their hands up and says, 
let the regional actors deal with it. Well, guess what? Uh, the Israelis have actually been deterred by what Iran has been doing in Lebanon, not just economically, but militarily with this surging of technology or this precision guided munitions project, which is really to take Hezbollah's rockets, many, not all of which come from Iran, uh, which are, you know, the difference between a rocket and a missile is that a rocket is a projectile that is not guided, and a missile actually has a guided system. And Iran has been smuggling these guidance kits that put fins and and, uh, and, and, and circuit boards and, and uh, telemetry equipment onto these, uh, these rockets and in fact turning them into hybrid missiles. And that, doesn't, and that means that Hezbollah's firepower has increased several fold. And as you see with the patron Iran, it's missile accuracy evolving. The proxy, Lebanese Hezbollah, its missile accuracy, its missile lethality is also going to be evolving. So you can't just rely on Israel to have to deal with the entire situation for you. Responsible countries need to step up. The first thing politically I think they can do is to disabuse themselves of this notion that there's the political wing and the military wing. This doesn't exist uh, for, for Hezbollah. Uh, to really sanction the entire entity. Um, I had another forthcoming article with, with a colleague. I'm just giving Ajak a lot of firsts here, but about uh, the Five Eyes Intelligence Group, which is, you know, majority English-speaking nations, a lot of them have designated uh, Lebanese Hezbollah in its entirety. Some have done the political wing. Some have done the military wing. Australia has not even done the entire military wing. So I think it's time Australia step up and Five Eyes, this intelligence sharing community, should really see 2020 on Iran and Hezbollah in 2020. That would be an amazing goal.